Hi everyone, thanks for coming. We're gonna give everyone like a minute to slowly start trickling in and then we're gonna get started. We're super excited for our talk today. We have something special for you guys, so get excited. All right, welcome everybody. Thank you all for coming today. So today we have a super special uh, talk prepared and a collaboration. Um, as you know, most things have been run by uh, GOMI and previously um, Shilpi with the, the Miami uh, Wilderness Medicine Group. Today we're joined uh, by Eric with the Rosalind Franklin Wilderness Medicine Group. Uh, and he's helped us uh, bring in Dr. Lewis who we're going to have talk today. Um, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at go underscore WME to see everything that we've got going on for all of our future talks and lectures. Our mission with GoMe is to create an educational platform where interested students and healthcare professionals uh, can get info on wilderness emergency medicine. Uh, we want to make this a diverse sphere from all around the country and around the world, and we want to make sure this is culturally competent. Um, as you guys are coming in, if you all can uh, turn on your videos, that'd be cool. You can put in the uh, in your name, where you're from, uh, and then as you have questions, you can put them in the chat, and I will keep track of them and ask them towards the end. It's going to be a little bit of a different type of lecture from our previous ones. Previously, we've had kind of slides and uh, questions at the end. This is going to be a little bit more interactive, uh, special, special surprise. Today, obviously, is Ski Medicine with Dr. Lewis. Uh, coming up, we have Expedition Medicine next week and a few more in the works and even more coming after May. I will turn it over to Eric to introduce Dr. Lewis. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Eric uh, from the Ross and Franklin University School of Medicine in Chicago. Um, I'm uh, born and raised in the Canadian Rockies, so it's my honor to, uh, to introduce Dr. Lewis. Um, she's also Canadian, I'm assuming. Uh, Dr. Lewis is uh, an emergency emergency physician. She's based in Whistler, uh, in beautiful British Columbia. Um, she's a rescue technician member for Whistler Search and Rescue. Uh, she's a ski patrol physician for Whistler Blackcomb. If you haven't heard of Whistler, it's a great place to ski. Uh, she's the medical director and guide for several heli ski companies, a medical consultant for rescue programs, uh, emergency management, and avalanche search and rescue in Canada. And she's also a consultant to the film industry, um, she likes to say that she's most comfortable flying at the end of a 100 foot long helicopter long line performing rescues deep in the mountains of, uh, and glaciers of British Columbia. And I hope like to say that one day too. Uh, Dr. Lewis, uh, thank you for being with us. I'd also like to say that Jordy is with us too. Jordy is our uh, cameraman. So uh, thanks to, to those behind <laughs> the scenes. All right, so y'all, so I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm going to spotlight Dr. Lewis's video so y'all can enjoy the show. Hi, everyone. Um, so as Eric introduced me, I'm Dr. Renata Lewis, and I'm super happy to be here with you today. Uh, the team that's brought you this uh, webinar today had a very fun and difficult time trying to track me down. And as I said to them, you know, my my um, ability to slow down here is a little bit hard, but, you know, we've made it here. So let's have a, a good hour or so together. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about ski medicine and, you know, mostly rescue ski medicine is really a, a niche area of medicine for me. So as Eric mentioned, I live in Whistler, British Columbia, Canada. It's a town of about 10,000 or so residents, but we serve uh, significantly more numbers than that. You know, anywhere on a given day, Whistler Blackcomb 
our big, big, you know, major ski hole here can have up to 30,000 skier visits. Um, we also have extensive backcountry. So our area where people will go and travel by skiing, by helicopter, by snowmobile is extensive. And we're talking into the hundreds of thousands of square kilometers for us. Um, so with that sort of scene set up, we have to also be prepared to rescue those who need us. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit uh, about that today. What happens when somebody gets into trouble and how do I personally as a, a physician and team medical director for Whistler Search and Rescue and a, a Black Home Whistler uh, Ski Patrol physician, how do I um, integrate myself into that? And, and what skills do I need? And what do I do on those work days for me? And, and how do I go about my day? So we're not gonna talk so much about the, the nitty gritty medical skills today as we are just going to be talking about what it's like to be a physician uh, in the outdoor remote uh, wilderness environment and the, the differences that that um, uh, is, you know, versus working say in an emergency department or a hospital or a clinic or a family practice office. So, um, so I don't know if you can see where I am right now, um, but I'm in the middle of a helicopter here. And so, with Whistler Search and Rescue and Ski Patrol, we use helicopters extensively. Um, because we live in very mountainous and steep, uh, glaciated terrain, forested terrain, lots of cliffs, rivers, um, our way to access people who are hurt is often most expediently by using a helicopter. So um, this is my work office. On many days, I'm very, very comfortable around helicopters. In fact, I'm married to a helicopter pilot. And um, we often work together actually. So, you know, with people like Jordy, Black Home Helicopters is our operator, our aviation operator here. And they do a, an amazing job for us. Um, we've got skilled pilots, skilled crew, skilled dispatch, and it all seems to come together really well with our working uh, search and rescue or patrol team members. Um, so this is a, a, what's called a B4. This is not typically actually one of our rescue helicopters, but as you can see, if you come out here, a big machine, um, you know, a lot of our machines are actually out still today, heli skiing, but, and uh, doing some other um, work today, but we're gonna use this as our sort of uh, example of helicopters. So um, typically for us, and I'll just run through helicopters here initially, um, the pilot will sit in the front. One of our team members, typically the rescue team leader on any of our crews will sit also in the passenger front side. And that's really for uh, communication, for visuals and how we operate, how we're gonna roll out an operation as it goes live. Um, you know, we'll have additional team members in the back and we can also have the ability to configure these helicopters with a stretcher. Um, oxygen and suction. So when we're uh, working with these helicopters, we, we do what's called medically configure them, or we, we, stre we stretcher configure them. And that means that it's ready to go for a patient just to be put right on in. But you can also imagine the helicopters where we're going aren't going to a nice flat cement helipad. We are going into all that significant, very difficult terrain Sometimes it's snowing heavily, a blizzard. Um, light is often an issue, especially a lot of our calls come towards the end of the day when people need help. Um, and because of that, we don't always sit inside the helicopter when we go to find a patient. We actually fly under the helicopter. And there's two ways to do that. One way that we more commonly still use right now is something called a long line system, um, otherwise known as HETS, Human External Transport System or uh, CDFL, which is a class D flight um, configuration. And so what we'll do is we'll dive under this helicopter here. And it, well, you won't see on this, but you can imagine underneath here, we would have a hook system along with a very long line that when we fly in, we're on the end of that, on the end of that line and we would get inserted into the terrain. So we might be inserted into like a forest full of 150 foot tall trees. Um, into creek beds, into uh, avalanche terrain is very common for us. Uh, so we use that with these sort of helicopters. We also have other machines that do something called hoist. 
Um, and hoist uh, access is pretty common uh, in the States. I know that for sure. You might have a bit of problems with noise here. One of our helis is just taking off. Um, and the hoist allows for more dynamic type of access. So it will come along and then we actually come out of the helicopter on a descending line, go down to the patient, deal with that patient, put them into a stretcher, what's called an ARP or aerial rescue platform. And then we will hook ourselves back onto the line and get zoomed back up. So that's a bit more common. It's a, a common technique in the States. Um, not as common in Canada, but we're getting there. So that's how we actually access our patients. But let's talk a little bit more about being a physician on a uh, rescue out in the wilderness. So in the hangar here, um, I've sort of set out a little bit of gear, very basic gear that we'll typically carry with us. The first uh, rule that we have within uh, search and rescue is, um, is safety, obviously. And for us, the most important thing is the safety of myself first, then my team members, and then the subject or the patient. We call them subjects typically. So it's in that order. Um, we do not want to harm ourselves or our team members in order to um, just evacuate or rescue someone who's already having a bad day. You know, we, we triage ourselves even that way. So in terms of me keep, keeping safe and our team keeping safe, I'll, let's talk to you about that. First of all, I need to know what I'm doing and I need to be prepared for the environment I'm going into. It's a little bit different for those of you joining from like Chicago or Miami or other places in that here we have four quite distinct seasons, but we basically delineate that as winter and summer operations. Because of our huge mountain systems and glaciers, we are prone to avalanches. And so we keep ourselves safe through the use of avalanche protective gear and gear that we know that if something should happen or if we have to go look for a, a patient or a subject in an avalanche, that we are equipped. We have to be self-sufficient. Self so why don't we just walk over here and I'll show you a little bit of the gear that we're using um, overall. So obviously our outdoor gear, we have to be well prepared. We have to be able to technically sustain ourselves for 24 hours in the wilderness. If that helicopter drops me off, flies away, and then can't get back because of weather, a fog bank, light issues, it becomes dark. Um, I get trapped myself. I've got to still be able to survive myself. So a 24 hour path is crucial. So I've got to be dressed for the occasion. And so, you know, we, when we wear full winter gear, um, we are dressed um, in many layers and protective gear. We um, also always have to have a way to travel ourselves. And I don't mean the helicopter and I don't mean the snowmobile. I mean self-sufficient. So when we go on a rescue, I always take my skis and I'll show you those. Um, and um, I've got to have a way to get out myself if something should happen. So um, I'll show you some of the stuff that I carry in my pack. This is certainly not um, all inclusive here. So I've got some gear, some really good, nice, dry, warm clothes that even if they get wet, they're not gonna make me cold. Um, I carry avalanche, I carry avalanche rescue gear. So if I get in an avalanche or I'm trying to find someone in an avalanche, I've got, um, three very important pieces of gear. I've got myself a transceiver. So I'm giving off the signal and I can find someone else's signal. So if someone's hidden under the snow or buried, I can find, find them and dig them out. So I've got that and that goes on right at the heliport. It's not in the field. Um, I've got a shovel. So a collapsible shovel that goes in here and then I can start to dig snow out. Again, sort of safety for myself and my teammates, and then also uh, the subject. And then I've got what's called a probe. So this opens up into a long system. Now I can actually start probing the snow 
if I can't see someone, but I find the signal for them, I can start searching around with my probe until I feel hopefully something soft and jiggly, <laughs> a human body, hopefully. So then hopefully one that's alive. So to find that person, I keep that there. And then I'm using my shovel to dig them out to the surface. Avalanche medicine is actually a very fascinating area that I've been involved in over the past few decades. I'm working as the medical advisor for the Canadian Avalanche Association and um, through ski guiding that I also do. So, you know, over, I don't know, a decade and a half ago, I developed what's known as our ABSAR uh, course. And to me, it was important to go beyond just finding someone. It was, what do we do when we get them to the surface? And that's where the medical aspects of avalanche rescue are so important. Um, I'm not gonna get too much into that today, but it is something worthwhile to read about and, and get familiar with if you go into that sort of terrain. So another thing that I need to be able to do is communicate. So we all carry radios with multiple banks on these radios. Um, and so I can talk to the pilot, I can talk to my team members in the field, and I can also keep communications with our SAR base and our dispatch because that's critical. They're our safety link back to civilization. So when we go out into somewhere very um, austere, they're keeping an eye on us as well and our backup. So I've got to be able to, to relay the information that I need um, and including patient status, which is really important for us here because of our distances. When somebody's very ill or broken up in the backcountry here, our time frames for getting that person to a trauma center are much, much, much more significant than you would see in a major uh, center. And because of that, I've got to be thinking ahead, constantly, constantly thinking ahead. Do I need like a, a, what we will call here a medevac helicopter? We have these big Sikorsky um, air ambulance um, systems here. And those take time to get to us. Typically our trauma patients go to Vancouver um, and that's our major center in, in British Columbia. So, but that they take time to get to us or us to them. So thinking ahead, what does this patient need? Where am I going with this patient? What do I need to do now versus what can wait? And you need to be efficient and um, be prepared for um, things to change very rapidly or unexpectedly. So this is a good tool to help with that. Um, more more uh, protective equipment. We always wear helmets when we go out. Um, if I'm flying under the helicopter, I'll be looking much like this. <laughs> um, it's very windy when you're flying 60 knots under a helicopter. Uh, and um, so we need eye protection, ear protection, um, and yeah, we'll continue on. Um, now, we're going to get to the patient here. One of the most critical things you'll see in trauma patients in the pre-hospital environment is that cold affects them very quickly. If there's one thing you can remember as a clinical pearl, even in the heat of summer, patients get cold very rapidly because they become stationary through broken bones or injuries or medical distress. And they, can't no they can no longer move, they can no longer generate that heat source through muscle movement. People become extremely cold. And when they're cold, if you uh, are aware of that lethal trauma triad, the colder you get, the less well our clotting mechanisms work. So if you think about somebody perhaps with internal bleeding um, and they're very cold, it's incredibly difficult to stop that internal bleeding. Your clotting systems don't want to work all that well. So true in the summer, just as much as in the winter, more critical in the winter, obviously. So one of the first things that we do if we can is that I'll have a team member um, cocoon that patient. If we're out talking about winter medicine today, you know, getting something underneath that patient, if we can move them, um, stopping that heat loss, if we can, it's difficult to regenerate heat out in the wilderness. Um, there's not a lot of very good uh, ways or methods to do that in terms of reversing that heat loss, but we try and we certainly can do what we can do. Um, you know, you're probably all familiar with these things, these sort of um, giddy fats, uh, reflective heat blankets. That's one method that we will go and try to stop hypothermia from, um, you know, setting in. 
Another product that we use quite frequently is something, these sort of quick warming blankets, these ready heats. And so these act much like a um, big blanket of those hand warmers that people use. And so it takes time to activate, you shake it right on. I, I won't open these because they're quite expensive. Um, and that will at least give the patient some warmth or source of heat for them. We also use things like warm hot water, warm tea. Um, and in the helicopter, we also have the ability to ask the pilot to, to really turn that heat on for the ride back to wherever trauma center that we're going to. Um, in the helicopter itself, um, I'll show you what we have. We have, we always carry an oxygen tank because you never know when you need oxygen. And that's what, that's just sort of a grab and go um, container. The other thing that we carry in the helicopter is uh, suction. So we have these sort of pre-hospital ones. These are a little old and dated on some of these models, but you know, the ability at least to have electric suction is um, really nice. Handheld suction in medical first aid kits don't tend to work that well. Um, and if you have the ability to get into a helicopter with electric suction, it sure makes your life a lot easier. So we will use that and have that ready to go, especially with anyone who, who you might be worried about vomiting or um, with bleeding orally, anything like that. Um, so some of the things that I teach my uh, patrol or my SAR members is that even when you have a helicopter that far away from you and maybe the blades are running and the pilot's saying, you know, we can go anytime. There are some interventions that you just can't wait to do, even if a quick flight to a heli or to a, a health center or clinic. Um, there's some things that you just have to deal with right away. And of course, you know, I'm talking about really your ABCs. Um, it's very uh, scary situation to put an unstable patient into a helicopter and fly with them. You're not going to be able to deal with patients all that well in these smaller type of, uh, you know, A-star or uh, B-4s, any of these sort of um, sized machines. So if necessary, dealing with the ABCs is really critical. Trying to stabilize a patient before you load them and go if you can and if you have the skill set. If you don't have the skill set or you're not quite there, you're not comfortable, you just keep rolling. And you know, we certainly um, have a variety of skill set in terms of first aid capabilities. Um, everything from you know where I am as a physician, but you know, right down to people who are taking just first aid courses and they fill other roles, but I might be on a call with them. So, you know, together we've got to figure out what's sort of the best um, uh, plan of action. And that often is done with the pilot too, because sometimes the pilots say, we're out, we have to go right now, we cannot wait. And if that's the case, then you deal with that as you go along. But ABC is often, you know, I just sort of brought a few little things out of my kit here. You know, um, we tend to use King LTs or eye gels, so superglottic airways in the field. Occasionally I will, um, intubate someone fully with an endotracheal tube. I did that about a month ago in a tree well um, fatality ultimately where somebody actually died falling into a tree well with snow all around that tree and uh, had also some significant trauma. And with that, you know, I, I did use an ET tube and we got the placement well, but uh, he, just, he was, had already passed away at that point. Um, you know, so airway, certainly breathing and circulation. You know, I do carry things like uh, chest seals. Again, you know, somebody could die on you. By the time that you get them in a helicopter and fly 10 minutes, they could be dead in that time. So easy interventions, ABCs are really, really critical. Um, certainly also carry things like bleed kits here. Um, I carry specifically any sort of these clotting type sponges, uh, sea locks. Um, tourniquets, pressure dressings, anything that um, I might need to stop a critical bleed. So, and I've had those um, patients and, and they're extremely scary, um, especially out in the cold, because as I mentioned, they don't clot very well. You know, things like pelvic fractures, we actually have big um, specific uh, um, binders, but you know, in a pinch you can use these what we call um, zap straps. So I might just sort of 
throw a few of those together, you know, and then wrap that around the, the patient's pelvis just to sort of bind that if I'm worried about that, like I was the other night. <laughs> um, and then an important thing for me, um, where I think that I can sort of also help go beyond sort of typical first aid. And if you, any of you that are interested in wilderness medicine, obviously, you can provide a really great advanced skill set in what you can quickly do on site, but also a huge thing for us is pain control. Um, people don't need to suffer. Um, if you've got the capability there, it's, uh, I would say it's almost a human right to not have to suffer. So, you know, we have everything from, I use this quite frequently. I think you've got this in the States, Pendrox, which is an inhalational um, uh, analgesic. It uh, works really, really well in the pre-hospital um, setting and patients in control of that. And that's just through breathing through this puffer system. If any of you haven't seen this, I'll give you a quick look at it. Methoxyfluorine, which used to be an anesthetic, an OR anesthetic, but the patient actually just sucks on that. Medicine goes in here and they, they're uh, getting very fast, rapid pain control that's self-administered and self-dosed. And it's hard to go wrong with this one. It's a, a pretty benign um, pain reliever in the right setting. So a lot of orthopedic trauma saved for sure. Um, and then I'll show you some of the other stuff that I carry in here. I don't know if I'm going to put in here, but I guess so. So other meds that I'll carry to, um, obviously that only I can administer, everything so, sort of from narcotics, uh, TXA for um, promoting clotting, um, a lot of pain control here, anti-nausea medication. Um, we often, and a lot of these are IV or IM. Um, I don't tend to use PO medication because it's we're not in the time frame of operation for a lot of that stuff. So, um, yeah, this is what we do. Um, often important, especially when flying with patients who head injured for sure, but even other people that might become nauseated with flight uh, and motion is to make sure that they... Um, have an antiemetic on board because you can imagine if you're strapped down on a stretcher in that helicopter and you're tight and cocooned and you can't move again it's a risk of aspiration if if they should vomit in the helicopter and you can't deal with it all that effectively so um important i always carry my stethoscope everywhere i go hi dr lewis is turning a part of your basic med kit um Yes, it is. I, I do, if I start running an IV and I'm really critically worried about it, I will use TXA in the field. I haven't done it all that much. Um, but if I do have a critical bleed, then we certainly, and IV route, then I will start administering the, the bolus, the loading dose of TXA. Um, not always appropriate, not always able to do it just because of the transport mechanisms and everything else that's rolling around that. But it's, it's in my drug kit. Um, Let's see, what else shall I show you? So I'll show you some of my ski gear here. So people often ask too, do you have to be an expert skier or an expert climber, uh, expert whitewater kayaker? You don't, but you need to be efficient and sufficient to operate without being a hindrance to your team. So um, maintaining and, and um, working on your outdoor skills is really critical as well. Um, it just allows you to move in the environment and people aren't suddenly worried that you're holding them back or you're a liability in terms of your operational rollout. So uh, if you need to work on your ski skills, now's the time to do it. And come to Whistler to do that. I'll show you around. So anyway, I'll show you here. Um, in the in the wilderness and wilderness medicine, when we're doing rescues, we always take, as I said, our ski gear. Some people use snowshoes. We don't tend to let snowshoes just be it because they're too slow. When I wanna ski out of a, a glacier or a mountain, I wanna be fairly fast if I have to be. So um, I've got ski terrain boots, my work boots that I also guide in. And then um, skis like these are specific to ski terrain. There's a ski terrain binding 
that allows me to actually walk um, and stride forward, much like a cross country ski. And then I can lock it down and it turns into a regular type of ski. So these are really important. Um, for those of you that don't know too much about ski touring, that's okay. People wonder, how do you get uphill? How do I actually walk up skis uphill without sliding back? And I'll just grab these. So these are called skins. And skins are important in the world of ski touring, very important, because you can't really go up without them. So you can see on this surface here, a really sticky surface, that attaches to the bottom side of my ski. And on this side, I've got almost what you would think of like shark skin. So you can see, I think you can see mm -hmm. there, it's a bit of like a, what used to be mohair. It's like artificial um, now, but it stops me from sliding backwards. It's a very thin system, but once that's on the ski, I can actually climb and I won't slide backwards. So when I get to the top, I rip these off and I put my skis bindings into ski mode and I can ski downhill. So for instance, two nights ago, um, we took a helicopter up to injure or to an injured snowmobiler that had accidentally, you know, flown, I don't know, 50 feet in the air on a snowmobile, broke the snowmobile seat and had a pelvic uh, fracture and a lower lumbar uh, compression fractures. And where he was on the steep hillside, couldn't get the heli in. So I asked the pilot just to set me up on a ridge. We popped out with all of our medical gear, our vacuum mattress, um, and we skied everything down to our patient. We dealt with our patient and then we dragged them further down the hill and the helicopter could land below us. So sometimes we're doing mixed, mixed methods in there. We're doing part of the access by helicopter, maybe part by ski touring or skiing down. Um, and uh, you know, you have to be prepared for all of that. It's not good if you show up on a call and you can't make your way around um, the situation. So that's important. This is one of the last things I wanted to show you here too. So this is one of the helicopter stretchers. So um, typically when we, when I mentioned that we would do um, a medevac or medevac configured helicopter coming in, this would already be laid out in the helicopter. We remove one of the front seats. This goes in longitudinally in the heli. And we have a vacuum mattress, which is a, um, I could have one of those, which is a system that we use now for um, any sort of, sp even spinal injuries. It's a way that we cocoon patients and, and um, basically vacuum pack them, um, if you can imagine that. And we put them on this in the helicopter. And this is uh, how we would transport them in the heli. Because you can imagine if we have a spinal injury, we can't just put them in a seat. So. Um, this is very important. And the pilots are a huge help for us. They're all very experienced mountain rescue pilots. And um, so they're constantly helping us in part of our team. Good question. Oh, yeah. So I'm gonna hear a little bit, a few more questions here. Just give me one second here. What do you use to keep your, I mean, I'm freezing. Good question. So what do I keep, how do I keep my medications from freezing? It's a very important question. So um, I actually have an insulating uh, type of uh, packaging. And I actually also just use a, a hand warmer in there. I usually, not too hot, because you don't want those things to get too hot either. Um, but um, it's enough, I've tested it enough over the years. When I ski guide in the heli, I'm also using that just as a backup for me. And it's always worked really well. I also, you know, our helicopters tend to have what's called a ski basket on the side, where all our gear goes when we're actually flying out the heli. And I won't typically put my backpack in the uh, external aspect of the heli because I don't want it to freeze when we're flying through the air. So I usually bring my, my own backpack once inside the cabin with me. Any other what's another question here? I'm just looking at your questions, guys. What uh, courses would you suggest? No, 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 it's from the mess part of an avalanche rescue. So that's a good question. The question was, um, someone who's done basic avalanche rescue training, how do you gain more skills and awareness around avalanche medicine. There are a few quick uh, courses that have popped up I've seen online um, or advertised online, I should say. Um, it, uh, it depends on what field you're going into. Certainly, I always recommend people in Canada, they would do something called their level one, which is an industry level out of the recreational level. 
So that's more of a professional uh, basic course, level one. And then if you're going into something like you want to become a ski guide as well, you want to become a rescue technician, those courses are out there um, and they will become more and more um, available. Another thing that I'm in the midst of doing right now is actually organizing an online video skills library. So that would have to do more with all the aspects of rescue, but we're planning to also do a lot of the intricacies of uh, first aid in the pre-hospital world. So we're just talking with a few corporate sponsors on that right now, just to fund the project and see where we get to. Um, and I will let Eric know and he can let all of you know where you can follow me. And the other thing is I'm on Instagram. If you, it's the only thing I'm on. And if you want to see some of the rescues and uh, wilderness medicine work, I am on there as airwolf underscore MD. Um, and you're welcome to take a look at that and, and see what's on there as I post things on there all the time. So let me look one more question here. Another one. Good How do you assess? Oh, okay. How do you assess for pneumothorax with the heli blades running? Yeah, good question. So um, again, you know, if I am in a situation with a critical patient and I'm worried about it, you can ask the pilot to fly away. So they will go up and they'll circle around and they'll go and, and just hang out. They'll often just do circuits around you or they'll go land up on a ridge top. Um, and that gives me the quiet. If I'm really worried about that and I need the quiet and I need to figure that out. But I'm also relying on clinical signs. So, you know, um, all the things that we get taught about those other conjunctive signs of a pneumothorax are also important, not just the auscultation part. So, but if I'm worried about it, I just, I will tell the pilot, hey, can you just literally buzz off for a few minutes and I, I just need to like deal with this here in the bit of peace and quiet. That's typical because helicopters create a lot of noise and they create a lot of like snowstorm, what we call a snowball effect. There's stuff blowing everywhere. So typically they'll let us off and they will most often fly away for a while, like five, 10 minutes, and we call them back in on the radio. I'm just gonna read a couple more of your questions here. Do you have any specialist gear for initial vitals for monitoring? Yeah, sure do. So for initial vital sign assessment, um, we have, we carry an AED with us as well, um, an ALS model, so I can always hook people up for that. We have blood pressure cuffs, um, pulse oximeters, and I bring my stethoscope. Um, so we're getting sort of the most critical things that we need. Um, right off the bat. Um, I don't tend to do field temperatures. That's not something I'm worried about unless we're really worried that somebody's been out for three days frozen and I need to know where they're at. But even then that's not so effective in the field. So we, um, we do sort of just basic stuff. We carry our sort of slick, smaller size uh, vital sign measuring devices. I hope that answers what else there is. How do you get into this full-time job? Uh, this is really, uh -huh. Okay, so how did I get into this? So this isn't a full-time job, it can, and not like Europe. So Europe would be um, where they have professional paid mountain rescue teams. And here we actually all are volunteer. Um, and um, although we are supported by the government, they will reimburse us for our costs, but we are not um, um, paid for our services here at all. So. Uh, as much as I'd love it to be a professional uh, full-time job, it's not. And our, our call um, volumes wouldn't probably sustain that either, I think. You're, we're not going out to 30 cases a day. Um, so, you know, it, it is, it's a great position to be in here. I, I think also guiding for me, like the, the summer and the winter guiding for me really complements this well. It allows me to also work for fun in this environment and as well bring my medical skills as backup and then on rescues it's sort of just a an easy form of this profession for me um i would say that emergency medicine certainly you need emergency medicine skills whether or not you want to go through a full residency that's sort of up to you and where you ultimately want to practice um, but i also know people who are orthopedic surgeons cardiologists uh, family practice, um, you know, and any of those skill sets will have some value. You know, if you get the basic emerge skills that you need, um, it's that that's definitely, you know, you're on the right path there and you'll gain more skills as time goes on. You know, this is not something that they so easily teach you how to like, you know, intubate in a blizzard, you know, that sort of thing is really on the, 
on the job learning and it takes a long time to gain those skills and those I don't I can't call them opportunities but those <laughs> events that happen where you are learning and you're gaining skills and and you're mentoring and you're getting mentored maybe by other people or like for me working with critical care flight paramedics on the ground like wow it's like super you know they know stuff that I don't you know don't know because I didn't learn that in medical school and they learned it in paramedic school so you know there's a lot of that information and, and cool sharing that goes on overall um what happens in the U.S. yes yeah so the question there is um shifting away from c-spine immobilization in the wilderness or pre-hospital environments and how um how much do we pay attention to that you know we go by our criteria which you probably all know but you know our c-spine criteria has a definite certain um rigor to it um i personally have more um ease by following that and being okay with that. But I always tell our members, if you're at all unsure, it's okay, just put the collar on. Um, no one will fault you for overdoing something, but they will certainly fault you for underdoing something. And then I think that's an important differentiation. If you're not sure, you're not, um, you're, you're not doing anything, you can do more than you need to. You'll never be looked at as a poor performer in that situation. They might say, oh, you didn't need to do that. Why did you bother? It's like, well, on the times where perhaps you, know, you should have done something and you didn't, that's a much bigger deal. So um, just think about that in your, uh, in your criteria. You're all going to be positions. And so you're you know, you're going to be in a different game than, say, somebody who is uh, even a ski patroller or uh, a basic paramedic. You know, you're, you're going to be in a, fitting into a different realm there. So, um, but if you're unsure, don't just do more than you think you need to. That's what I would say. No one will fault you. Let's see another question here. Um, where are we here? Oh, how do you work on chain of patient to do precise procedures before? Boarding, yes. So again, that sort of alludes to um, how do I do precise procedures around the helicopter? Um, I can also ask the pilot to shut down. So it will be dead quiet just like this and I can be working there. And often that's helpful because we can talk directly to the pilot over the shoulder. Um, if, uh, and there's one of our pilot, pilot ski patrollers. Um, if uh, need be, or I can ask the, the helicopter to to take off and go around typically what we'll do is we have like where we're working on a patient and then we have what's called a staging area for the heli and so if I you know recently I had a paraglider that was speed skiing so he jumped off a, a peak near here and went about 50 feet in the air and then went straight down into the snow and broke his femur and where he was was really difficult to deal with. We could ski into him, but the heli couldn't get to him. And so, you know, the heli could come in part way. We towed in. We sort of held power. We jumped out. The heli took off, and then we went to the patient, and we could work with that patient. But it wasn't an easy area. It was a very steep hillside. So, um, you know, we did what we had to do. Sometimes things take a little bit longer, but we knew we couldn't move him without. Um, kind of working on them a little bit longer, making a platform in the steep snow hillside there. And then what I ended up calling was for um, our long line rescue team to come in and, and pick them, pluck them off the side of the mountain, because that was the easiest way to do that as well. So, you know, you can do precise procedures, but you're not, it's a, a bit of a fine balance because you're also not sitting there trying to do brain surgery. You want to be efficient. You do what you have to do and that's good. You need to move. The patient's not, you're not going to necessarily save a patient's life by, uh, you will with those certain few key um, procedures, but there's no point in staying any longer than that. After that, their best chance is to get to a health center or clinic, a tertiary trauma center. So the faster you can expedite that process, the better off you are. So it's a bit of a balance, a bit of an experiential 
you know, getting comfortable with that and um, keeping things rolling. You don't want to stall out. You want to keep things rolling in a calm, efficient manner. And that's working as a team with a pilot and your team members. Uh, any, let's see where we are. We're doing questions. Doing great, you guys. How do you, uh, how do you have? Mm -hmm. Okay. So how do I manage exposing patients for an exam out in the wilderness? And I don't know if I brought my thing, but anyways, so what we do is we, as I said, keep patients warm as much as we can. I personally use something called um, a RAB, company's RAB uh, Bothy, and that works wonders. So what happens is it's almost a, a floorless tent, and but the walls are made out of humans, so to speak. So we can put a patient underneath that. Our body heat uh, generates the air temperature rise very quickly in those scenarios. and. It's an excellent product. I shouldn't really be <laughs> um, promoting any one company, but I, I really like that product in terms of making a shelter for a patient, working under that and keeps out the wind, keeps out the sleet, the snow, the rain. Um, it, it warms up the air in there and uh, it's a nice little piece of equipment to have. Um, but shelter in any way, we have tarps, we have guides tarps, we use whatever we have to. Um, to sort of shelter ourselves if we have to stay that long. Often we don't have time to do that though. Often if we know that we're lickety split, we're trying to get out of there, we will um, do what we have to do. We'll locally sort of protect the patient, but we won't be putting up these more immense sort of shelter systems around them unless we're stuck there or we're waiting out a weather window or anything of that sort. So, uh, let's see. Uh, how big of a team, okay, so how big of a team do I respond with and what's the structure of that team? So for, on the mountain, so Whistler Blackcomb, Ski Patrol Medicine, every day on Whistler and Blackcomb, there are two doctors working on each mountain each day. And we're supported by our Ski Patrol team, which are phenomenal. Um, and many of those Ski Patrol members are also paramedics. And so we've got that really great, benefit of having an advanced skill set uh, of, of helpers on the mountain and we've got great gear and it's we're really helped out by that system typically you know on the hill if there's a call on the on the ski hill one or two patrollers will go to that call and they will radio back to dispatch what their requirements and their needs are with a brief synopsis of what's happening with that patient age um, and injuries, typically what's going on. And, and then they will call for what assistance they need. So do I need just a toboggan to get this knee injury off the ski hill? Or do I need to call a code three? I need a helicopter on standby. I need the doctor. I need uh, you know, the doctor's path, the oxygen, everything. And so they're trained to roll that out and call those out as appropriate. When we're working search and rescue, our teams are much smaller inherently, right? We cannot fit many people in a helicopter like we would ski hill. I've been at calls where I've had 30 ski patrollers there um, and everybody's just helping out. Uh, in search and rescue, you're really defined by how many people can go and how many people can come back in the heli. So that's a big one for us too. If we know that the patient has a back injury, is paralyzed, is unconscious, we know we've lost at least two seats out of the helicopter, if not three, because of this way the stretcher fits into the heli. Um, and so we know we have to send the best skill set and the most efficient skill set out to, to roll out that call. We can always ask for more helicopters to come with more team members, but we typically, on most initial calls, if we don't have many details, we will send out our strike team and, and highest skill sets to go into the field and um, assess and you know call for backup if necessary. So not that many, usually two, three, four, typically, you know, and then we'll have a SAR base and dispatcher as well behind us here on the ground. So yeah, not as many as the steel. Um, uh, get on Okay, so what is my scope of practice as a doctor with ski patrol or search and rescue? 
So in Canada, we practice, our scope of practice is anything that um, uh, we would actually normally be able to do even in a hospital or emergency department. We're, we're allowed to do those things. There's no actual limitation on us in terms of what we can perform. Um, I think where people go astray in terms of especially new physicians or nurses or paramedics into the field is that they think they got to do everything out there and they don't. And you're actually often doing your patient a disservice by thinking that way. Your patient is better off in a nice, warm, controlled environment with endless amounts of hands to help you and a bear hugger and nice IVs running and that they're not benefiting by spending more time out in the wilderness. So. Um, you know, we're allowed to do what we would normally do, but, you know, we don't have, we don't have the same equipment out there. We don't have the same skill set to back us up out there. Um, and that's more a limitation, but we can technically do, you know, we're allowed to do anything that we would normally do um, in the hospital. So, um, how do I, oh gosh. <laughs> How do I balance? How do I balance my my career as a doctor and volunteering for this on the side? I think it really depends on where your passions lie. So, I am a physician that doesn't necessarily. Um, maybe I'm not typical that way. I'm not sure, but I really have a blend of it, and I sort of live more for my passions than I do just to go to work. And some people are driven by work and that's super amazing too, to go to work and they need to be at the hospital every day and that's where their passion lies. So for me, you know, I became a guide after becoming a doctor. And um, because I knew these, these two passions for me ran parallel and I looked for a way to combine them and um, be an active outside. And how do I translate my medical skills and my profession into the outdoor world? And, and this is how I've ended up sort of working as a, a guide and a ski patrol physician and a search and rescue physician. So, um, you know, I probably don't make as much money as a typical uh, physician that would be say working in the emergency department every day or doing all their shifts like that, or, you know, in the OR, um, but I'm okay with that because it, to me, it's a, a, a passion. It is a, um, a service to the community and very so much gratitude around it that it really feeds you to continue to do that and you work with great people um every day is completely different and new every call there's no common call there's no routine call it's i mean it is much like working in the emerge that way but even the pilot you're working with that day might be different who shows up on your search and rescue team as your um little search and rescue so like that's to might be totally different. Um, so you, you know, and how things roll out, other helicopters coming in to help you and the patients are completely different. And um, I think that's really just a, such a fascinating way to, you know, combine those skills of the outdoors with uh, medicine. Now, let me just read a few more of these questions here. Um, as you can see, what are the top three to five injuries that we see? I'd say that the majority of our calls are orthopedic trauma. Um, we don't tend to see as much like just sort of general medical illness, although we do have seen that. Um, you know, I recalled one time that there was a 60 year old lady that we got called to uh, find and, and bring down from the mountains one summer. And she was palliative from uh, renal disease and had been told she probably didn't have long to live, couldn't get her kidney transplant, was deemed not appropriate. And she always had wanted to climb this one mountain. And um, when we flew in and found her on a big boulder, she was green and gray and had been vomiting. And it was a hot summer day. And, you know, it's very quick to react to to people like that and go like, what are you doing out here? And, um, you know, how silly, how like, how stupid can you be to like put yourself in this position and then you called out the search and rescue team, but you never know. And this lady, it was her bucket list item was to go and climb this mountain before she passed away. And I think she passed away a couple months later. Um, so, you know, it, it also makes you stop and pause about 
why people are out doing what they do and following their their love to do things and um and reminding yourself not to be quick to to judge people getting into trouble you know I, I always think people are so embarrassed when we pick them up or you know they think that they've done something wrong and I always tell them that I'm I'm one knee turn twist away from needing search and rescue myself probably on any given day so you know it's uh it's a service that we give to people. They don't pay for it here. And uh, they're very appreciative of it overall. Any final words? Any final words? Wow. Well, I think it's amazing that, you know, wilderness medicine has come so far. I remember when I was in medical school, that was in 1995 to 99 is when I went through medicine. And wilderness medicine wasn't, it was kind of there, but it wasn't really much of a big topic. And uh, I remember back then going to a wilderness medicine conference and I met Paul Auerbach, who's like a big author in that field and um, talking to him at a conference in Colorado. And um, it was just this kind of a burgeoning field, people very interested in that. And I think now it's exploded. People see their point to it and the, the value of it and the, the need for it. I think, you know, during COVID, we've certainly seen here in Canada and BC, particularly the explosion of people into the backcountry and people needing um, rescue and assistance and to find their way out. And, um, you know, I'm sure it's the same in the States. And, uh, you know, I think that it's got its benefit to that. I think it's beautiful to see people out enjoying themselves, but, you know, people also have a bad day and they have bad luck and, um, I would say, enjoy yourself, enjoy yourself, gain the skills, practice your skills, work with your teams, get your emergency medicine skills up um, and uh, you'll be a benefit. If you can join a search and rescue team and volunteer or you know, work for the park service, um, work as a consultant. Um, I'm doing a lot of work now in the film industry as well. A um, few shows coming up and you know, just being put into an outdoor, environment as a physician people find that quite fascinating but it's a value too right for things like a film crew they they're very thankful to have somebody that you know can help rescue their cast and crew too so you know it's an endless sort of opportunity and i um, applaud you all for uh you know finding your passion in medicine it's a it's an, a great one and it will, won't fail you you'll always enjoy it so keep well and healthy doing it though Oh, okay. Do I just want to go outside? <laughs> I don't know if they can hear us. Let's see it. We'll go. That'd be great. Go. We're going to just show you outside here for a second. Okay. This is like one of our, our uh, oh. so a little bit of a low cloud cover today, but normally you'd see our big snowy peaks. This is Pierre, one of our pilots. And here's Brooke. She's a pilot, but she's also one of our ground crew. And so um, this is more one of our common helicopters that we use. We would take this seat and this, these two seats out and and then our patient would be traveling in here. And then come around here to, this is, I'll show you the ski basket, our uh, mighty uh, ski basket. So in here, we use this, well, we use this heli ski, this box for all skis go, but in here is where we would put all our equipment. If we had clamshells, spine boards, vacuum mattresses, our trauma kits, our doctor's kits, um, our skis, our own personal backpacking gear, anything like that would go in here. Or in what we call these squirrel cheeks, these, and there's storage compartments there. Um, uh, it's a great system. I'm thankful for helicopters for sure. Saves a lot of Anyway, does anyone else have any other questions? Dr. Lewis, I got like five texts saying this was the coolest session we've done. We've done like 15 so far, and this has been a crowd pleaser. So thank you so, so much for doing this. Oh, my thank pleasure. you for, for organizing. Uh, thank you all for coming. This was amazing. Oh, my pleasure. If you want to message me, as I say, you can just message me through uh, email or through Instagram. Happy to answer questions or guide or, you know, you're making choices about what you should do or skill sets or, you know.
know, training and um, um, I'm happy to help in any, any way at all. I think it's great what you guys have done here, putting this all together. So happy to help anytime. Thanks so much. Enjoy thank yourself. you so much. <laughs> we definitely will. Thank you again, Dr. Lewis. My pleasure. We don't want to take up any of more of your time because I know you're super busy and you clearly have a horrible office to return to. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, anyone that wants to reach out, I'll be sure and share your email and everybody else. Thank you so much for coming to our talk today and hope everybody has a great rest of your day. Bye. Okay, bye.